Hello everybody, it's your favorite history teacher, Mr. Thomas, and I'm here today to talk about the age of exploration, when Europeans go and encounter the rest of the world. And I love starting off with this particular slide because it shows a caravel, which is a kind of ship that was the workhorse of the time period. Ah, oh, look at her. Ain't she a beauty? In any case, let me start off by showing you some of the reasons that the Europeans wanted to go out and explore a little bit more. And these are push factors, getting Europe, Europeans out of their own continent and into other, uh, other areas of the world. Now, it starts off with these changes that are occurring in the East. Let me minimize myself up into the corner so you can see these things a little bit better. First, the Mongol Empire was declining, and therefore trade on the Silk Road was becoming more dangerous, and so the cost of those goods increased. And the Ottoman Empire, that is an empire that is expanding as well, and they're going to tax those goods on the Silk Road that come on through. Europeans are looking for a way to get these products with spending less money, because that only makes sense. They don't want to pay the middlemen. The Ottoman Empire, its height, you can see it in the red right here. I love to point out that it's not just in the Middle East. It extends into Northern Africa, large parts of Asia, and even into Southern Europe over here, and Southern Spain down in this area. Down in here, it's what we now call Indonesia, and these islands are going to be known as the Spice Islands. And this is going to be a spot that a lot of countries are going to vie for control of, because Europeans love the spices that are coming out of that region. The three G's are also the big motivating factors for Europeans. They want gold. They want to spread the religion, so God, and they want to become famous. They want that glory to put their mark in the history books. Remembering these motivations as the three G's, gold, God, and glory, should be able to help you remember some of these motivations. Gold and silver, that is obviously what a whole heck of a lot of people want in the new world and other areas like africa are going to provide opportunities for europeans to fill up their treasuries spices is another way to gain a whole heck of a lot of money you buy the spices for low prices in one area and you sell them for a much higher price in another area vasco da gama on his one voyage makes a three thousand percent profit not bad for that portuguese sailor Natural resources, of course, are in here too, whether it is ivory or timber or the spices themselves later on, tobacco and cotton and other kinds of things. These raw materials can be manufactured into expensive luxury products. Now, the overarching economic principle behind what a lot of Europeans are doing is mercantilism. Mercantilist nations believe that there is a limited amount of wealth in the world and that the more wealth you gain, that gold and silver, then the more powerful you are. This is a big change from what had been the resource that nations were looking at before, which was namely land. The more acres your country had, the stronger it was. Now they're starting to switch. I'm not saying land is unimportant, but it's that gold that they're really after. The stronger the nation, the more wealth it has. That gold, that money can come from all sorts of areas. Notice that you have large amounts of silver that are coming out of Spanish regions in the New World. The Brazilians are going to have gold that the Portuguese are going to be able to get. Even this part of Africa is going to be known as the Gold Coast and later on the Slave Coast. Uh, but you also have those silks and other luxury items and spices that are coming out of Asia still. As for God, Europeans want to spread the word of Christ. They want to make other people Christian. Now, some European nations, like Spain and Portugal, are going to push Catholicism. Other European nations are going to push for some of the Protestant religions. Typically, though, we're going to focus on Spain and Portugal, both Catholic nations, and the Catholics do a great job of spreading the faith to large parts of the rest of the world. A special call out to the Jesuits founded by Ignatius Loyola, who are really adept at trying to sp spread and push Catholicism onto the natives of the New World. Now, the Protestants will be able to do this as well. They just simply are second string compared to the Catholics. As for glory, that fame, gaining some status, putting your mark in the history books, having people remember you when you are gone, that's going to be a big motivation uh, for a lot of Europeans as well. Remember, during the age of the Renaissance, you have this new push for humanism. 
talking about human potential and achievements. And this age of exploration is going to fit hand in glove with that idea of humanism. Plus, you have the new printing presses, so your exploits can be shared and spread throughout other countries. And the kings that are going to sponsor these voyages are going to be able to get their name down in the history books, too. Heck, you got a great picture of Columbus over here, trying to show that he is doing this for God and king, but he's front and center in there, too. He wants to be remembered. There are great kinds of technologies that enable this age of exploration. And one of them is that lovely old ship, like you saw at the beginning, the Caravel. First created by the Portuguese, they had taken some European designs as well as some Arab designs that they had been able to see and made a new kind of a boat that was fast, maneuverable, was better at steering, could go into shallow water, use square sails for power, but notice these triangular sails that are also called Latin sails, you can use those to tack into the wind. In other words, you can sail into the wind in a zigzag formation. Now, it's gonna go slow and it's gonna be hard, but it becomes possible. With these new ships, they're gonna able, they're going to be able to have a larger cargo area, throw some cannon, throw some guns onto those things so they can defend themselves. It is going to be a great workhorse boat. As time goes on, of course, the compass originated in China is gonna move along the Silk Road and the Europeans are going to start to build their own compasses you're going to be able to see what direction that you're heading in because European compasses are going to use magnetic north in order to go ahead and figure out where north is. You can then just do the opposite to figure out south and east and west comes from there. Better maps and using latitude and longitude on maps to try and figure out your position is again going to be one of those things that Europeans become more adept at calculating, especially at sea. Latitude is going to measure your distance north or south of the equator. Latitude lines are those lines that go horizontally. Longitude lines, that will tell you how far east or west of the prime meridian you are. And longitude are long lines that go straight up and down. If you know your latitude and your longitude, you know exactly where you are on the earth. An astrolabe and a sextant are two other ones. Astrolabe, they're like this product that you see up here. These things are going to enable you to measure uh, stars above the horizon. Think astro, think stars, you know, like an astronaut or astronomy. And these can help you find latitude. A sextant down here, no giggling. Sextant right down here measures distance of the sun, stars, and planets to one another. And if you are adept at its use, you can find latitude as well as longitude. Now, the whole reason that this thing has a funny name is if you look across this angle down here at the bottom, this is one sixth of a circle. And if you counted, you'd have 60 of these little gear teeth going right around, around there. There's 360 degrees in a circle. One sixth of 360 is 60 degrees. And the Latin number six is pronounced sex. That's how it comes around. Who were these explorers and where did they go? Well, I'm gonna focus on the Portuguese for this little section right here. Prince Henry the Navigator. You can see a great picture of the fellow right on there. He is well known as a Portuguese prince who raids the Moroccan city that is just south of Portugal, finds all these riches and goods, and he realizes, wow, if this one city has these kind of riches and goods, wonder what the rest of Africa has to offer. And this increased interest in Africa uh, puts a, a, a bee in his bonnet, and he goes ahead and starts a navigation school at Sagres in Portugal, just a peninsula in the southern part of that country. This navigation school is going to have people there that can train new navigators. Now, there's going to be people that are uh, you know, well-versed in the art of navigation, mathematics, astronomy. Uh, they're going to have map makers there, instrument builders, because you got to get your sextants and you got to get your astrolabes and all this kind of stuff. And they're also going to work on ship designs. Prince Henry the Navigator, he does go on voyages, but not super long one. His voyages are small and tend to be focused you know, on the coast of Portugal and into uh, Africa just a little teeny bit. His claim to fame isn't as an explorer so much as the founder of the school that enables a whole heck of a lot of other people to explore. 
And this is a picture of part of his rebuilt school. The original one actually got lost in an earthquake. They rebuilt it on a nearby peninsula. One thing I love to show is this big circular area down here. Uh, that is a compass that is made into the earth. And you can see the various degrees with the weeds growing out of those lines that go across there. Oversized instruments meant they were that much more accurate. And this is just an example of a huge oversized instrument that they would be using. Bartolomeu Diaz, he's a fella who is going to be sailing for Portugal and he is the first European to sail around the southernmost tip of Africa. He had been sailing, got caught in a nasty storm, and that storm blew for several days. And by the time it was over, his ship was leaking, uh, his sailors were exhausted, uh, they had suffered some damage to the ship, but they found that when the storm had settled and the navigator was able to go and take some readings, that they had rounded the southernmost tip of Africa. He originally goes back to Portugal and calls this thing the Cape of Storms. Whereas the king looked at him and thought, well, that's a horrible name. Who the heck wants to go there and rename it the Cape of Good Hope? Because they had good hope that this was the last major obstacle as the Portuguese were exploring the coastline of Africa. And now everything was about to change and they could go to the southernmost tip of Africa and come around and get to India. And that's exactly what happens. You can see his route that takes him along the coastline, gets up to the other side of Africa. He wanted to continue on. His sailors, though, they were almost in a state of mutiny because they did not want to take these leaky, damaged ships any further. They wanted to get back home. Several years later, Vasco da Gama, same guy I mentioned earlier, is able to make it around the Cape of Good Hope all the way up to India and makes a mad profit that's coming on through. He establishes this Portuguese sea route going from Portugal around the Cape of Good Hope and then up into India. You can even notice on this uh, map down here at the bottom where you can see the zigzag nature of his ship going right here. That's those Latin sailors enabling him to sail into the wind. Amerigo Vespucci, he's an Italian who will be sailing for Portugal. He had about four voyages, uh, some of which were for the Portuguese, one of which at least was for the Spanish, but he's the one that's credited with the, realizing that South America was not just a big island, but it was actually a continent. And he did this because of his uh, views of the Amazon River. And he realized a river that big with that much fresh water had to come from a continent. It couldn't just be some stream on a small island somewhere. The German map maker, Martin Watzemuller, is going to use Amerigo Vespucci's name uh, as the namesake of a new continent. And Amerigo becomes feminized and Latinized to America, and hence we fit North and South America. You can even see on the Watzemuller map, Way up here at the top, you've got a picture of Amerigo Vespucci, and you can't really see it too well, but down here in South America is where you're going to see that uh, name America. The Spanish, they're going to have Christopher Columbus that is one of their main sailors going for him. He is an Italian. He's actually from the uh, city-state of Genoa. Tries to get the Portuguese to actually fund his voyage, but... After the Portuguese discover the Cape of Good Hope, they realize they don't need Christopher Columbus because instead of going south around Africa to get up to India, Christopher Columbus wanted to sail west into the Atlantic Ocean and keep on going until he hit China and India. His theory was that the Earth was much smaller than it actually was, uh, and it's probably very lucky, serendipitous for him that he did bump into uh, the Caribbean islands that he did and eventually into uh, South America as well. Because if he didn't, those guys probably would have starved because he was wrong. The world is actually a lot bigger than he expected it to be. But with a continent in his way, he bumps on into it, he could resupply. He sails west across the Atlantic trying to reach Asia. This is, according to the old story, of course, why he called the people that he met Indians. Uh, they were actually Carib Indians, uh, as well as some Tainos as well. Uh, met other native groups as well, but those are two of the big ones. 
he does do four voyages in total and he gets a sweetheart of a deal he is able to be given the title admiral of the ocean sea and on his first voyage in 1492 his three ships the nina the pinta and the santa maria has some 90 sailors or so now the old wives tale that the queen which was you know the king and queen of spain at the time were ferdinand and isabella the queen isabella was said to have sold her jewels to pay for this that is not actually true she did at one point in time offer it her husband says why the heck are we going to be selling our own stuff let's get somebody else to pay for this voyage instead and they get some bankers to go ahead and fund it he spots land after 33 days and he lands in a place that he names uh, uh, San Salvador. The sailors were quite happy to hit land. He calls them India. Uh, the Santa Maria, as he is exploring, actually runs aground. And so he takes the wreckage of the Santa Maria, builds a fort. They call it La Navidad. Uh, think like Navidad, like Nativity and all that kind of stuff because it was right around Christmas time that that gets formed. He leaves about 39 guys there, and this becomes the first Spanish colony in the New World. By the time he comes back several months later, they're all dead. So it wasn't exactly the most successful colony that's been out there. However, whoops, you can see a remake of his three ships here. They are relatively small, certainly not anything like Jing Ho's ships uh, from the treasure fleet in China. His voyages, you can see that. I know it kind of looks like a mass, uh, a mess of lines here, but first voyage is in blue. His second voyage is down here in red, then green, and then his last voyage in yellow. And you can see he really focuses in on these Caribbean islands, but he does touch off onto what's Central America and South America as well. He never sets foot on anything that would be considered the United States later on. He is also the namesake for the Columbian Exchange. And this is nothing more than a global transfer of food and plants and animals and even people and diseases and ideas between the old world, which you'd think of as Europe, and the new world, which you'd think of as North and South America. And two food products coming from the Americas, corn and potatoes, get brought back to the uh, old world and these things help to feed countless people corn and potatoes uh, for the amount of land that it takes up to cultivate they produce a whole heck of a lot of calories and potatoes even they're underground they're tubers so that if you know you have an army that happens to march across your field they might not destroy all of your crops and you could still dig up some of those potatoes whereas you know your army marches across a wheat field your wheat crop is devastated on the other hand you do have some bad things like smallpox that get uh, taken from the old world to the new the natives in the New World do not have any kind of natural resistance to smallpox, and smallpox will wipe out, well, millions, tens of millions of native people. It's going to be devastating. Vasco Balboa. He is a Spanish conquistador, and conquistador is a fancy word for conqueror. He is going to become the person that settles the first settles that creates the first settlement on the actual south american continent so not a caribbean island and in 1513 he crosses the isthmus of panama which is that narrow strip of land that connects central america to south america it's only about 50 miles wide he is the first european to lay eyes onto the pacific ocean and he claims it and all that it touches for spain and that's what you see in this picture down him down here is him going into the Pacific Ocean to claim everything that it touches for Spain. Also, notice that he's got his dogs along there. He does take war dogs with him and uses these war dogs to attack native villages on his way to the Pacific Ocean and back from it to take their gold. Remember, gold, God, and glory. Ponce de Leon, he is going to be a fella who comes, hits into uh, the colonies that Spain have set up in Hispaniola, which is this big island right down here. Nowadays, it's broken up in half to Haiti on one side, Dominican Republic on the other, but the entire island itself is Hispaniola. Now he comes in there at a time period where smallpox, slavery, and just brutality has destroyed the population of that island. Christopher Columbus had put them to mining gold. 
And Juan Ponce de Leon is actually taking this ex, uh, expedition up to Florida to capture slaves, but he is also searching for this mythical fountain of youth. I guess that's why so many old people retired to Florida? I don't know. Anyway, Ferdinand Magellan, he's a Spaniard that believes that Christopher Columbus was right, only he was wrong about the size of the globe, and he was, well, bumping into a couple of new continents. But Magellan thought the underlying principle, sailing west to get to the east, was doable. And he's able to take an expedition that began with five boats and starts in 1519, and he is able to circumnavigate the globe, which is a fancy way of saying to sail around the world. He is the one whose namesake is at the southern tip of South America, and it is a strait or narrow waterway that goes from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean through the islands around Tierra del Fuego at the southernmost tip of South America. Magellan does get killed in the Philippines. However, his crew makes it home in one ship in tatters, about 18 guys out of the over 200 that began the journey about three years earlier. But Magellan gets credited for the first to sail around the globe, but he did die. His crew are the ones that really make it. And you can see his journey here, coming from Spain on down the coastline of South America. The Strait of Magellan is right down here. He comes through, cuts across the Pacific Ocean, and you can see where the crew, see where Magellan gets killed. The crew elect a new leader, and he's able to take them through the Spice Islands, which they do load up with spices, sail across the Indian Ocean, and right back on up to Spain. Not bad. I love this map because you can see where a lot of these nations are going to have their influence. The Spanish in the red really are going to be taking the Caribbean and the coast of South America, the Pacific coast of South America. The Portuguese in this purple color, they hit on places like Brazil, the coastline of Africa, going on over to India. And you do have a little peeing bit of England coming around here too. One term that I want everybody to know is the Iberian Peninsula. That is this peninsula in Europe that is circled here in black, and it consists of Spain and Portugal. So a person from the Iberian Peninsula is usually of Spanish or Portuguese descent. And this Treaty of Tordesillas comes around in 1494. And this is the problem. Spain and Portugal are both exploring areas of the world, and there's a chance that Spain and Portugal might get into a fight. And that is the last thing that somebody like the Pope, Alexander VI, is going to want. Spain and Portugal share that common border on the Iberian Peninsula, and if they have a conflict somewhere else in the world because of their colonization, then that conflict might spread to Europe on that common border. The last thing the Pope wants is two Catholic nations to fight one another. So the Pope is going to step on in and create this line on a map, the line of demarcation. And anything west of the line is going to be spots that the Spanish can claim. And anything east of the line is going to be the stuff that the Portuguese can, cl can claim. And generally speaking, the Americas, think like Central and South America, go to Spain. And then Africa goes to Portugal with one nice exception. The Portuguese, from the original line of 1493, get it pushed out further and they grab Brazil, which is why to this day, people in Brazil will speak Portuguese. The Spanish did not mind this so much because the Portuguese had bumped onto that as they were coming down the coastline of Africa and there's a large ocean current here that's going to push Portuguese ships over. But the Spanish were finding their gold and their silver in places like the Caribbean, in uh, what's now modern-day Mexico, but it was part of the Aztec Empire there and part of the Incan Empire down here. This land that far away wasn't uh, as important to them. I'm going to stop here for today, but next time I come to you, you're going to be looking at how Spain conquered the people in the New World. I'll leave you with that teaser. Thank you.